share my presentation and we'll start Let's start. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Welcome everybody um, to the August uh, 2020 version of the Varaha Mehra Science Forum monthly lectures. Uh, this is not only this month's lecture. We also step into the fourth year. We have completed three years uh, as of last month, and this is the we start the fourth year with this talk by Saman Subramanian today. I'm going to go through a list of the talks that we have presented earlier. We started this forum in 2017 with my lecture on Antoine Lavoisier and the origin of modern chemistry. At that point, we were not even sure whether this was taking, taking off, so we kind of had a, an entrance fee and all that. That's what you see there. And we did it for a few talks, and after that, uh, we've had a good response. So we have continued uh, successfully. The motivation for starting this forum was to provide the public in Chennai, in Madras, with a forum where they could hear lectures about science not only targeted at professionals in a particular field, but to the general public who are interested in not just science, but also the history and development of science, the personalities behind it, the stories, the events, the controversies. We get to hear only textbook narrations of how something developed, not the struggles and the failures and the controversies and the battles. So that was kind of the motivation for it. Chennai actually has a long history of uh, several such fora, but uh, they've always been kind of private fora. And so this is, you know, that is uh, targeted at a particular group, like engineering colleges would happen in an engineering setting or IIT or something like that. The talks on medicine would happen in a medical college or in a, or in a hospital or something, something like that, a medical conference. So this is kind of an attempt to make a generic, uh, and we have done fairly well so far. Let me go through all the uh, talks we have had. The second talk was by Badri, one of our co-hosts, who talked about uh, the marriage of uh, geometry and biology, if you could call it single helix, double helix, triple helix, the three discoverers of it. Uh, most famous of it is, of course, Watson and Crick, but there is a Madras connection with uh, G. N. Ramachandran, and so that was uh, that topic that, that month, followed by an unusual topic, hidden phages of medical history about bacteriophages by a young uh, teacher, Sivaraman. Uh, then about Isaac Newton and Principia Mathematica by Siddharth Chandrasekhar. Uh, Aladi Ramakrishnan's theoretical science. This is actually one of the seminars that Madras has hosted. It has hosted such giants. Uh, this, this was hosted by Aladi Ramakrishnan, son of the famous lawyer Aladi Krishnaswamy who wrote the constitution. And Ramakrishnan's son, Professor Krishnaswamy Aladi, who is a maths professor in uh, Florida, gave us this talk. And they have hosted such, you know, uh, for, for their physics seminar, they have hosted such people as... Uh, Niels Bohr and Murray Gelman and you know several Nobel Prize winning uh, scientists and others and he gave a talk about how that led to the creation of math science. Then he had a young scholar Akash Narayan who's right now in the Fermi lab in uh, Illinois. He gave a kind of a generic thing he called atomic theory for Alvelu party. How this atomic theory developed in a way that the general public can understand and all you know avoid as many equations as possible to develop a you know, common public presentation. We had to talk about geology before for the former geological survey uh, regional director, the geology of Madras, wandering rivers and cruising coastlines. Venkatesh Ramakrishnan spoke about tech advances in the traditional city, the, ad the advent of different new technologies in Madras. It was the first plane flow and when were electric trains introduced, water management, uh, hospitals, x-rays, medicine, cars, were you know, did all these kinds of things that, you know, we don't get a historical perspective of that. We get to hear a lot about the freedom struggle, but not this one. Then we had Mr. Narsaya, who was, uh, uh, you know, he was the ground engineer, or he's a crew, you know, he's a flight engineer on uh, INS Vikrant, the first Indian aircraft carrier. He, you know, he was on the crew that uh, came from England to India, you know, on this uh, aircraft carrier. And he gave us a talk about his life and how it was molded by, yeah, and talked about turbines and all the other technologies that these uh, uh, ships used. And, we had a series a summer camp for children on Indian mathematics and astronomy, which I conducted. Uh, we had Shashwat speak about the Indian monsoon from way back in history, quoting Kalidasa and literature and all the way up to modern understanding of meteorology. We had a, a talk by Dr. Sita Sunaram, who's a professor, who's a teacher, researcher at the Sanskrit College in Madras. 
she talked about a tamil book called astana kolahalam 15th century book uh, it's um, details into tamil uh, poetic book on mathematics operations research things like that we had dr dayanandan a professor of uh, mcc biology at mcc talk about evolution and its grand heritage and you know 200 years of the history of evolution and what life itself was and how you know how much we have learned since then then i gave a talk we were talking only about uh, in english so i gave a talk in pandai nagarigalin vanilam kanidamum so the mathematics and uh, uh, astronomy of ancient cultures uh, sumeria egypt china etc i gave a talk about that last uh, two years back we had arvind gupta the extraordinarily popular speaker talk about science through toys This was one of the most popular talks we had. The hall was thoroughly full. Kids were just totally excited. He had a wonderful, our wonderful demonstration. The videos are all available. We had a talk by Kannan Rajendran about the history of the Periyar Dam, which was constructed about the hundred years back and made South Tamil Nadu fertile. Um, Dr. Uttara Dorayajan, head of the of the physics department in MOP Vaishnav College, gave a talk about Lilavathi's daughters, the women scientists of Madras who contributed enormously. A lot of these names are completely unknown to us. she gave an excellent history of these people for about uh, you know about 150 years dr v s ramachandran the uh, the famous world famous neurologist from san diego the author of phantoms of the brain gave a talk about the heuristics of scientific discovery and uh, you know uh, his on how his inventions and uh, his discoveries contribute you know he use examples from his discoveries to explain the talk he gave a surprise second talk about the relevance of freud in modern neuroscience a month later Uh, then we had Badri speak again about the structure of the ribosome. Venki Ramakrishnan's Nobel Prize winning work. We had uh, Sadish Kumar Saravanan, then a scholar at the Leibniz University, talk about the brief history of gravity. Uh, we had weather and sang- climate in Sangam poetry from Dr. K. V. Balasubramanian, who is a meteorologist in the Madras Meteorological Observatory. Uh, that was on Meteorology Day, so it was kind of nice coincidence. We had a speak lecture on architecture of the gods, the kings, and mortals by Mohan Ar- Mohan Hariharan, an architect. We had Ramana one of our co-hosts talk about CRISPR, a gene editing tool, and what from what it promises. We had a, a budding neuroscientist talk about the development of neuroscience as a history. Um, then we had uh, Akash Narayan again speak about the story of light, starting from the Big Bang theory to today, the discovery of you know Newton's uh, prisms experiment, from Alhazen's experiments, Varaha Mehra's comments about light, uh, rainbows, and so on, all the way up to Cla- James Clerk Maxwell and what we think today of science and. Uh, we had a nutrient biologist nutritional biologist dr arun kumar talk about the nutrients in food is another lecture in tamil uh, we had a talk about gilbert lewis by sitar chandrashekar this was about uh, the man one of the most important chemists of the 20th century um, then we had uh, another talk we this talk was by the children uh, we had arvind gupta talk with the children then we decided to host the children themselves to do a talk and this happened last november and children from four different schools gave talks on different uh, topics including the experiments they had done one of them has won the you know won a contest they went to singapore and showed off uh, showcased their experiment there about water you know uh, simple devices to determine water purity and then they won an award there um this is the logo that we developed uh, we had dr k srinivasarao of math science talk about the life and works of c v raman on his uh, uh, you know on his month he was born then we had a course uh, besides the talks we do couple of courses this is a course i taught indian history indian mathematics and astronomy and we did a couple of these so we did four batches of this so far uh, now the last batch has been done online and badri has done something now we'll come to that in a minute then schools children of another school sevalaya school in a village nearby dr professor swaminathan our mentor gave them a platform they you know he she, they built a sundial for them one of our friends mr narayanan built a sundial for them they learned how to use the sundial what are the principle they actually installed it in their campus grounds the teachers were taught and then they taught the children and so on uh, we had uh, the art of scientific discovery as, as uh, last december we had another talk by professor dr v s ramachandran we had ramanand jagannathan talk about uh, virus spread of viruses and information this year we had a couple of talks in the, the march talk we missed because of uh, uh, you know the corona virus lockdown Uh, Badri has done a couple of workshops now. This lean internet equations about Aryabhatta's algorithm. Uh, then Ramana, Ravi Prabhu, Ravindran gave a talk about uh, what is this thing called artificial intelligence. He's a he heads the Robert Bosch AI Center at IIT Madras. We had Pranay Lal, an author on the Indi, a, a book on geology, talk about the Thar Desert. We had Professor Arun Srinivasa of Texas A&M University. He discovered a 19th century book by an Indian who's kind of unknown. uh and he gave a talk about learning geometry to paper folding 
this month badri has conducted a course on bhavana and chakravala about how brahmagupta and uh, jayadeva and baskara gave us uh, new tools to deal with uh, mathematics especially about second order uh, equations independent equations and now we come to saman subramanyam and i'll hand it over to uh, ramanan to introduce the speaker of the day yeah thanks gopu uh, good evening everyone uh, today's talk by uh, shri saman subramanyam is titled a dominant character on the science and politics of jbs halde and is jointly presented with tamil heritage trust first we will talk, uh, i will introduce or give a brief about the uh, topic uh, about jbs halde uh, his life was rich and strange never short on genius or drama he is best remembered as a geneticist who, is, who revolution is our understanding of evolution but his peers called him as a polymer he foresaw in vitro fertilization peak oil and hydrogen fuel cell and his contributions range over physiology evolutionary biology and mathematics beginning in 1930s haldane was also a staunch communist a stance that enhanced his public profile led him into a lot of trouble and even through suspicions that he was spying for the soviets it is the duty of scientists to think politically haldane believed so and he sought not only to simply to tell his readers what to think but to show them how to think he wrote copiously on science and politics for the layman in newspapers and magazines and he gave speeches in town halls and on the radio author c clark called haldane the most brilliant science popularizer of his generation haldane also has an, had an indian connection and spent his final years in india uh, now let me come to the speaker speaker shri saman subramanian's narrative journalism has appeared in new york times magazine the new yorker the guardian long read wired harper's and bloomberg business week among other publications his reviews and op-eds have been published by the new york times politico europe the new yorker and atlantic his first book following fish travels around indian coast won the shakti bad first book prize and was shortlisted for the andre simon award his second book this divided island stories from the sri lankan war won the 2015 crossword prize for non fiction and was shortlisted for samuel johnson non fiction prize and the royal society of literature onjate prize the same year his recent book is a biography a dominant character the radical rise and restless politics of jbs alde personally uh, i am a fan of samant i have read his uh, uh, first book following fish and i was absolutely thrilled with it so i am happy to be a part of it and uh, happy to introduce uh, samant and uh, uh, the talk to you over to samant now thank you thank you ramanan that's a really kind introduction and thank you badri uh, for inviting me on this forum uh, i hope everybody can see my screen is my share screen working great okay uh, so uh, i guess my talk is structured around this book that i have written uh, the biography of jbs holden and um, it is uh, i guess the first thing to say about it is why write about holden uh, i mean as far as we remember holden holden was quite a liminal figure he was once very famous uh in his day i say in the book in the uk uh, he was as famous as einstein as publicly well known uh and now he is known mostly in quite small circles uh, some readers of his uh, essays and books biochemists evolutionary biologists geneticists may know him but his his you know essentially his work is so foundational that even these scientists may not deal with holden's concepts on a day to day basis so why did i and how did i come to him well i mean i approached him sort of backwards i uh, this was a british scientist who had moved to india in the 1950s and for us in india who follow the sciences uh, usually the movement of scientists is in the opposite direction from india to other countries and so i thought this was quite curious um i mentioned this elsewhere in fact that the first time i ever heard holden's name i thought it was a maharashtrian name i thought uh, this was jbs haldane and uh, when i discovered that he was a british man who had come here i got even more curious and then i started reading a little bit about him and you know even if you read the barest outline of his life on a wikipedia page or anywhere else you will 
it's impossible to not be fascinated with this this is a man who lived an extremely intriguing boisterous principled dramatic life and this is quite apart from all the important scientific uh, discoveries that he made this is a man who grew up uh, with a scientist father the scientist father used to experiment on himself and when holden was a young boy he experimented on holden also uh, he wrote holden went on to write his first paper in the trenches in the first world war he fought the fascists in spain during the civil war he experimented on himself just as his father did jbs also experimented on himself this was for the british war effort during world war 2 uh he fell out with the establishment in britain again and again he was in fact suspected for a long time uh, by mi5 the british intelligence agency of being a spy for the soviets uh he moved to india in 1957 Samant and he died there in bhubaneswar in 1964 Samant can you make your presentation full screen uh ah uh, uh, is this does this work yeah okay it's yeah. just my notes are on the other slide so i'm wondering how um let you me just check this yeah you will get a notes view which will give you the notes alone um you can switch the view so this is uh on your presentation you can just switch to right but if i if if i do this you see only my presentation is it what are you seeing now now i see the notes ah that is weird um i'm wondering whether it is not possible to for me to see one thing and for you to see another you it is possible uh, you in, in your uh, presentation you should be able to change the view uh just me one um i'll tell you where in yeah in your it's a powerpoint presentation right yes there is in the option there is something called presenter view in your uh, view option yeah so i am on use presenter view yeah i have ticked that yeah select that i mean just click on presenter view right that's done and then share the screen i don't know what you can see now <laughs> yeah no we are not seeing anything other than your uh, face now i mean still oh right 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 one second if you share the screen on the presenter view that should be fine right are you so you should be Yeah. I'm not able to see the notes yet. I mean, I'm able to see the notes if I move to a different window. That is the thing, uh, which I think you can also see, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, let me do one thing. Uh, just give me a minute. there is another way also we can manage this if you which, which is what if you if you just give me the presentation hmm you send it through uh, whatsapp 
I will just uh, broadcast it, and you will have uh, you know you can then make the window small. You don't even have to do it full screen. I can do the full screen. Okay, should I email it to you, Badri? No, you can just push it through WhatsApp if that is faster. No, my WhatsApp is somewhere else. That's why, unless uh, email. Yeah, you can email it. Email it. Just a minute, so the viewers will. You know, wait. Yeah. It shouldn't be a problem. So we'll, uh, for the sake of viewers, you just give us one minute, and uh, we'll be back on stream. Once you mail it, you can uh, talk about something or other, uh, Samant, about uh, uh, Haldane, and then we will have everything going fine. Right. Um, yeah, I've sent it to you now, Badri. Yeah, that's good enough. Just go ahead and talk. Right. I will uh, get things going at the same. Right. Right. Apologies for that glitch, everyone. Um, for some reason, you should be able to see one. Um, one version and I, I should be able to see another, but that's not, but I will continue talking at least because I don't think you need the slide for now. Um, I was talking about Haldane's sort of quite dramatic life. And, um, uh, and this was, as I said, this is, you know, by any stretch, this is a life that I definitely wanted to read about, read more about or know more about. Uh, it, it's utterly remarkable. But then on top of that, you have these layers of his scientific work. He helped to dramatically transform the study of genetics and evolution. Uh, that was his most prominent work. And we'll come to sort of what that involved a little while later. But he did a bunch of other things. He formulated an enzyme kinetics equation that's still relevant today. He proposed a viable theory for the origin of life. He produced a partial map of a human chromosome, the first time anybody had ever done that. He estimated a rate of mutation for human genes, how fast uh, or how many generations does it take for a human gene to mutate. These are all very vital advances in genetics and science for their day. Uh, I think we don't remember him for a single uh, singular achievement the way we do, say, Franklin, Watson, and Crick, uh, who had discovered the double helical structure of DNA. Uh, Peter Medovar, the Nobel Prize winning biologist, called Haldane the cleverest man he ever knew. But Haldane's genius, Medovar said, was not to bring new land to cultivation. It was to enrich the soil. And I think this is a model of science that we forget even exists quite often because uh, we are per perpetually thinking of big discoveries um, massive papers that change the course of science, but very often bread and butter science involves this kind of soil enrichment work that Haldane did and did so did so well. Uh, Badri, you can move to the next slide, or can I move? Do you can you can do it yourself. Uh, you 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 just you know minus on a full screen mode. You right. you can uh, have it as a non full screen mode, so you can have any other window and just click on this window, or you can ask me to move also. That's fine. Yeah. Right. Okay. Got it. Um, so you can have your yeah. notes on your window. And Great, this works well. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can use cursor also to go up and down. Yeah, I'm just checking out how this works. Right. Um, in, in tandem with his science and all of this uh, scientific work that we will talk about, he also espoused a very radical politics. Uh, he had a leftist inclination that began when he was a young man, and that ultimately culminated him carry, becoming a card-carrying member of the CPGB, the Communist Party of Great Britain. Now, these are not always the most convenient times for anyone to be a, a communist, uh, but there were certainly times when scientists and other intellectuals actively allied themselves with ideologies. Uh, Haldane wasn't the only one, but he was definitely the most prominent uh, communist intellectual in Great Britain at his time. So it was a pretty exciting, heated time that he was living in. And I wanted to examine that also, this time in which scientists, science and politics sort of combined in quite combustible and interesting ways that maybe we are starting to rediscover now. And the final piece of his public persona was as his status as a communicator 
of science. He wrote copiously for the lay audience on science, uh, not only his own research, but also the research of other scientists. His uh, essays and columns appeared in the Daily Worker, which was a Communist Party newspaper. They appeared in American magazines and British magazines, Indian magazines sometimes. Uh, books, essays, he gave talks. One year he gave as many as 100 talks. Uh, you know, all of this earned him a wide and rare kind of celebrity for a scientist. Uh, once he, in fact, he gave a lecture called A Dialectical Approach to Biology, and 200 people turned up. I mean, uh, the organizer said we couldn't get a hall big enough for him to talk in. So he used his writing and his speaking as a large platform on which to deliver his ideas on science and politics. So I was, you know, you put all this together and I was quite fascinated by the man, naturally. This is a man who had once been such a titan, so influential in the public sphere, and has been forgotten a little bit now. And I want to know more about what he saw as the influences of science upon politics and vice versa, and the relationship between genetics and politics in particular. Uh, etymologically speaking, genetics is the study of our origin. Politics is a study of citizenship. And we obsess so much about all these notions today about origins and citizenship. Uh, and I found Haldane had a lot to say about these notions that are still quite relevant to us today. So in short, that is why I wrote the book. Although I have to admit, writing a book is the most painful way to educate yourself about something. Um, so I wanted to present to you uh, what I uh, what I call a Haldane in three acts, not just the Aristotelian model of drama or anything. This is not a three act play. It's just a division of Haldane's life for our purposes now. Uh, the first is to uh, provide uh, uh, sort of a, a sense of Haldane uh, as, a, as a person. Um, Uh, not just uh, his career, but also the experiences that shaped him and that contributed to his politics. Uh, the philosophy of biography, at least in my view, is to explain how the circumstances of a life mold a person. So that was really what I set out to do when I wrote the book. The second act is to provide an overview of his political stances and why he came to them. I think the political arc culminates in what is commonly called the Lysenko affair. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that. I just want to sketch it out so that we can think about the question of science and its involvement in politics. And finally, uh, I want to describe in some small and totally unscientific way my experience in archival research. Uh, this was the first time I'd ever done uh, research sitting in archives, looking at papers. Previously, I've only been a journalist interviewing people, going to places, doing face-to-face -face interviews. So I, when I started off, I wasn't quite sure how I was to go about it. I expected it to be painstaking, and it was. Uh, but it was also quite moving in a lot of interesting ways. This is not the kind of sentiment I think JBS would ever approve of, but the relationship you form with someone when you pour over decades of papers, you know, handwritten papers in particular, is I think really worth discussing uh, for our purposes. So um, in act one, uh, I want to talk about, uh, you know, uh, hit the arc of his life to a certain extent. Um, he was born in 1892. Uh, he came from quite a well-off background. His family was an old Scots family. Uh, and his father, J.S. Haldane, John Scott Haldane, was a, a physiologist. He was primarily concerned with respiration, with literally the act of breathing. Uh, Haldane Sr. didn't really believe in science just being done in a lab, uh, just so that you could write papers and publish them and earn an academic reputation. He truly believed that science had to benefit the world at large. So Haldane Sr. would often go into schools and tenement buildings, slum buildings, to test how well ventilated the air was, for example. He would go into coal mines to determine what was killing miners in explosions when they were otherwise unmarked, their bodies were otherwise unmarked. He determined in fact that it wasn't a deficit of oxygen or an excess of carbon dioxide that was killing them. It was an excess of carbon monoxide, which would slowly seep into your blood, make you kind of drowsy and um, uh, rob you of your consciousness quite slowly before killing you. And he would run, uh, to discover all of this, he would run tests on himself. J.S. Haldane would seal himself in a box 
he would experiment with varying mixtures of air and uh, he would see what he felt at any given time sometimes he blacked out sometimes he would throw up you know this tendency to self experiment stayed with his son as well later as holden uh, jbs holden said once you could test a rabbit but it can never tell you what it is feeling so what is the point uh, so the young jbs uh, also became a part of his father's experiments and his travels and this is quite notable for the people that he would meet as he was uh, helping his father the now for a young boy from a from a wealthy background the kind the profile of people that jbs met this is not the normal kind of person you meet in a in the course of your life so you know these slum dwellers sailors coal miners uh people like that you know naval divers these are not the kind of people a boy from a young wealthy british family ever runs into so uh, one of my arguments is that this is a political education in itself for jbs just as a an act of witnessing how people in other classes of society lived uh holden went to eton the prestigious uh, grammar school in england and then he went to oxford where he graduated with a degree in classics and mathematics so please note he uh, he didn't have a degree in the sciences he was always quite proud of the fact that he never had a degree in any of the sciences this is another vital element in my view of the holden story because he studied classics you know the humanities as we might call them he always was what you might call a profound humanist uh if you look at his papers and his essays they're always filled with quotations from greek literature norse mythology the bhagavad gita um poetry literature he once wrote a paper on aristotle's observations on the dance of bees and he related it to uh carl von frisch's research on that same subject uh philosophically holden's background in the humanities also meant that he never stopped thinking about how science affected people and how science fit into society uh this is an interesting uh, element of a larger historical trend by 1959 uh the philosopher cp snow was already complaining about what he called the two cultures uh theory which is that science and the humanity humanities had diverged into these two distinct worlds two distinct spheres and the cross pollination between them the conversations between them were diminishing quite rapidly certainly now i think a pressing problem in the sciences is the lack of a grounding in the humanities i think it hinders scientists uh, quite a lot when they are considering the social and political aspects of their work there's a lot more specialization now but back uh, in the early 20th century there was a time at least when it was possible to study the classics and became a and become a biologist as as holden did uh holden fought in world war 1 as i said he went to france and he went to mesopotamia uh you can see him wearing quite interesting kilts as part of the uniform of the black watch regiment which was a scottish regiment um he was invalided twice injured twice and the second time he was shipped to india to recover he spent a year in india uh recovering and here also he met uh men of different men and women of different social ranks uh and in, in the trenches in particular he saw that class seemed to completely melt away you know officers and soldiers mixing together as they never could otherwise uh if they stuck to their social classes back in england so there was a lot of camaraderie and uh, he craved a lot of this company i think he was a boy who had been bullied in eton uh, never quite fit in either in eton or oxford and when he found himself fitting in with these into this relatively classless society in the trenches he really took to it as a result he came away saying that he enjoyed the war uh, it's a it's a strange thing to say maybe part of it is just because he was such a contrarian he liked to shock people and this is a thing that he could say to shock people but he also liked as i said belonging to this impromptu society of the trenches uh he came back from india at the end of the war and he worked first in oxford and then in cambridge and finally in uh, university college london which is where he spent uh, the biggest chunk of his career uh, there's, there's a photo on the slide here the third photo on the right don't be misled by that photo uh, you know he's at a lab bench and he's clearly doing something with lab equipment but he was a famously clumsy experimenter he had huge hands very inept with uh, with the apparatus of uh, labs and he hated working with them also uh he you know in fact he even had to train himself for a long time to titrate properly 
So Haldane's tools, his primary tools were pencil, paper, and mathematics. Uh, he would say very famously once, an ounce of algebra is worth a ton of verbal argument. Uh, most commonly, his method was to take a set of field data that had already been collated by someone else, and he would put equations to work on analyzing it. So for example, when he first calculated the rate of mutation of a human gene, his method was uh, he took a big bank of data on hemophilia and how it ran in families, hemophilia being the blood disorder that stops your blood from clotting. So somebody else had gathered all this data about the pedigree of families and how hemophilia ran through it. Um, and that had been assembled and he just took it and he analyzed it. Uh, the other thing he would do quite often, and it's a very interesting, uh, very intuitive way to do science, he'd set up a very simple scenario with an equation. Uh, and then he would start to vary elements of the scenario to see how the equation responded. So let me give you one example. In a famous series of 10 papers that he published beginning in 1924, he examined the speed with which one variant of a gene would spread through a population. So it, the, what the first was just a very simple uh, self-contained population. That was the first paper, but then he started to, uh, to uh, let's say tweak some of these aspects. So he would say, okay, what if multiple genes were acting to determine a single trait or what if a population moves around or what if part of a population migrates? What if there's an intense, what, they, what you call an intense selection event by which I mean and, or something like a plague or a famine that acts upon uh, the genes of a population to determine who is which uh, organisms in the population are fit and will survive which ones are unfit and will not survive. That's an intense selection event. So he would uh, you know, constantly kind of tweak this. Uh, in my book, I compare this um, approach to jazz. In jazz also, if you know that, if you follow it, there's a melody, which is quite simple. Uh, and then you start tweaking it and you improvise on it. Uh, again, in Carnatic music, you have something called the nerval, where you render the line exactly as the composer has written it. But then you also, uh, according to the raga, you vary it. Uh, give it iterations, uh, put it through several different uh, melodic variations before you come back to the original line. So uh, Haldane was very much a, a nerval sort of guy when it came to doing uh, mathematical genetics. So by relying on mathematics to such a large extent, Haldane became one of three influential biologists who together formed what is called the modern synthesis. So what did they synthesize? Well, here's a quick and dirty version of what that work involved. Early in the 20th century, there was a division between uh, two schools of thought in genetics, Mendelians and Darwinians. So Mendelians uh, uh, profess themselves to be followers of Gregor Mendel. Uh, all of you may know Mendel's work in pea plant genetics and how he was the first to determine uh, these questions of dominant and recessive genes, if a particular gene is present uh, in, a, uh, in an organism, how it determines the, uh, the phenotype, the physical characteristics of the gene. So for example, you have a gene for uh, the wrinkled surface of a pea, you have another gene variant of this for the smooth surface of the pea, and depending on the combinations of these two genes uh, in an organism, the coat of the pea is determined, the texture of the pea, whether it is wrinkled or smooth. So these were the Mendelians. Uh, and Mendelians thought the effects of mutations in genes had to be discrete. So for example, you can only have wrinkled or smooth as the surface of a pea. You can't have slightly smooth or slightly wrinkled. That's not how it worked. It was quite a binary choice in most cases. Um, whereas Darwinians believed uh, in a range of small continuous variations that accumulated in a population. And sometimes you have these attributes where you can see a bell curve of, uh, of how the quality uh, changes through a population. So we talked about the texture of a pea, smooth and uh, wrinkled, that's a binary texture. But uh, if you look at height, for example, human height in a population, you don't only have tall and short, you have a range of heights they come in a bell curve. There is a thick part in the middle where most of the you know, average height people are clustered. You have some people who are very tall, some people who are very short. You have this range. And uh, for a long time, it was very difficult for biologists to 
reconcile one with the other. They knew that Darwinian nat natural selection uh, had to operate in one way at the level of the gene, but obviously Mendel's views of the genes were telling them very different things. And so reconciling these two worlds was quite difficult. So what the modern synthesizers did, this was Haldane and two other scientists, uh, very broadly speaking, they knit these schools together by proving mathematically that Mendelian inheritance could explain it, this kind of continuous variation also, these varying heights in a population, for example. And uh, furthermore, Haldane himself was the one who showed that natural selection was a powerful enough uh, force to act upon variants of a gene to bring about uh, changes in population in quite a short time. Before that, everybody thought natural selection was quite weak. Um, and that, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if it was only small continuous variations that were accumulating in a population as per Darwin, then maybe they could not bring about the significant changes that you see uh, in Mendel's school of thought. But Haldane with a series of equations, a series of papers proved in fact that it does not take many generations for these significant changes to accumulate in a population. Uh, and he used that, uh, he did that by uh, proving this mathematically. There's a lot more to say about Haldane's uh, work in biology. Let me talk about one further thing, uh, which is what is called the Haldane Oparin hypothesis for the genesis of life. So both of these men, Haldane and Oparin, Oparin was a Russian scientist. They individually came up with what is arguably the first plausible or credible idea of how life started on Earth. Haldane, in fact, was the first to use the word soup to describe that bath of nutrients upon which uh, solar radiation would act to pr produce the first primordial half living molecules that later went into making up the first cell. Uh, we've all heard now the phrase primordial soup and the theory of primordial soup uh, it even comes to us in our textbooks in school. Uh, that that is how life developed. But Haldane was the first one to actually set down this model that we've all studied. Uh, many years after he, in fact, set down his idea, there was a famous experiment in the 1950s called the Miller-Ure experiment. And uh, they tried to uh, synthesize in the lab uh, using the same ideas that Haldane and Operin had put out. They set up an apparatus uh, and they ran a uh, sort of jolt of radiation, electric current, I believe, in this case, through it. And that produced a whole bunch of amino acids exactly at Haldane, as Haldane and Operin had predicted. So it was a sort of uh, one of the rare cases when quite quickly uh, such a profound theory was uh, was proved in a lab. Uh, so this was a brilliant, you know, this paper actually was a brilliant example of how Haldane's mind worked. He wrote it in the 1920s. At that time, he had been a biochemist for a little while, uh, but he was by no means somebody who worked on theory of life uh, models for a living. But he, drew, he had a wide range of reading. Uh, he had a knowledge of disparate subjects. And creatively, he was able to into, provide an answer, a possible model or a possible solution for how life would be uh, synthesized first. Uh, in fact, the paper, if you look at it, and it's, it's online for anyone to read, uh, it starts off in typical Haldane fashion. There is a lot of stuff uh, that is not related to the main scientific uh, principles at all. It draws on his knowledge of literature, uh, mythology and so on. And then eventually he works his way to the, the model of life that he wants to put forward. And in quite a short paper written for a layman, not for a scientist, he manages to provide this deep, brilliant insight into life and its development. So um, I highly recommend that you seek that out if you, if you can online. Uh, Uh, just to finish off act one, I mean, in act two, we will eventually get to how Haldane gravitated increasingly leftwards in his political stance. But at the moment, just to give you a more complete idea of his life, I should mention that he went to Spain three times during the civil war that started there in 1936. Um, he allied with left-leaning Republicans in their fight against Francisco Franco's fascists. And often he was on the front lines uh, trying to, you know, I guess, reprise some of the thrills that he felt during the First World War. But he was also helping um, uh, 
the Republicans with, uh, you know, ideas on gas warfare and how to protect against it, uh, ideas on how to protect against uh, air, aerial bombing raids and so on. Uh, there's a Woody Allen movie that some of you may have seen called Zelig. And in that movie, the Zelig character seems to encounter all the, you know, chief figures and go through all the chief episodes of the history of his time. Um, Haldane was very much like Zelig. You know, so for example, when he went to Spain, he was smuggled over the border from France to Spain by a very young Marshal Tito, who later went on to become the leader of Yugoslavia. Uh, he was on the Spanish Spanish front with uh, Ernest Hemingway quite often, um, with Martha Gellhorn, another journalist of her time who was uh, Hemingway's partner. Uh, when he was in Spain, whatever he learned about aerial bombing, he brought back... Um, uh, to use during the blitz in London in the Second World War, these ideas of how to design an air raid shelter, uh, how best to protect people while planes are bombing you. He designed an air raid shelter himself. And in fact, he pushed and pushed for the government to adopt his design. Uh, during the war also, he got involved in uh, some research on submarine warfare. At the time in 1941-42, the conditions uh, underwater in a submarine, you know, the kind of pressure and temperature and uh, gas mixtures that and how they acted on uh, human bodies, that was still not properly understood. So for, when the British government asked, he ran tests on himself and some of his colleagues. Uh, he experimented mixtures of air with varying temperature and pressure to see how the human body reacted. And it made him quite unwell, actually. He used to get convulsions. He would throw up very much like his father, in fact. Um, at some point during these experiments, a bubble of air settled on his spine and it troubled him for the rest of his life so that he could only sit on soft cushions. Uh, he could never sit on a hard surface after that. And then in 1957, Haldane and his wife moved to India. They went to Calcutta first, where PC Mahal Nobis recruited him to the Indian Statistical Institute. Uh, it wasn't surprising. I mean, these are two big egos. So obviously they fell out and there was a lot of bureaucracy at ISI that uh, Haldane did not enjoy. You have to sign into a ledger, you have to clear all sorts of spending if you want to send anyone on conferences. So, uh, but but this was, ISI at the time was where India's five-year plans were being scientifically and statistically designed. And to be there, Haldane was very excited. He, he thought very much that this kind of technocratic policy making is the best model for statecraft. Uh, after he fell out with Mahal Nobis, he was offered a lab in Bhubaneswar by Biju Patnaik's government, uh, the chief minister of Odisha at the time. So he moved himself and his wife and his students to Bhubaneswar and he lived there until he died of colorectal cancer in 1964. Uh, naturally, he donated his body to science. Uh, it went to a medical college in Kakinada and I'm told his skull was there until the 1980s before eventually um, the remains were disposed of. Uh, in a proper fashion. On the right, you can see a photo of Haldane uh, in Bhubaneswar. Clearly, he adopted Indian clothes. He was a big fan of uh, South Indian vegetarian food in particular. Uh, he, he, he talked about this quite constantly in his letters back home. Um, let me move on to Act Two and what I uh, perceive of as Act Two over here for our purposes which is the, you know, I mean, uh, I know this is a science forum, but my premise here is that science and politics are quite uh, deeply intertwined. So I think it, uh, we really need to study uh, Haldane's own move towards the left, why he moved towards the left. And from his life, we can pinpoint a lot of the influence on him, influences on him that led him to the stars. Um, first, again, as I mentioned, uh, you know, his father's work, which seemed to prove again and again that the government and big industries, big capital, they were, they were quite hand in hand uh, uh, at the best of times and the worst of times. And they did not care about the conditions of labor of the working class. So, you know, Haldane as a young boy saw the conditions of the working classes that uh, I'm talking about. He would go and visit mines and he would visit coal mines um, under, under in early submarines, uh, below decks in ships when his father would work in these places. And he would see, Haldane would see how these men suffered, even as they were feeding the machines of capitalism and imperialism. But the fact that he met these men and he got to know them personally, and he saw how often their life turned into tragedy, I think all of this had a profound effect on him. 
Second, as I've mentioned, his time in the army, uh, which was an education in how a classless society could function and thrive. Uh, Haldane's own personality was something of a maverick. You know, he was always anti-establishment. The establishment here in Britain happened to be a capitalist one. Uh, one of his friends said that if Haldane had been born and grown up in the Soviet Union, maybe he would have been a hardcore conservative or a capitalist. Just any excuse to go up against the establishment he took. So, uh, you know, this sounds like a very funny remark and it's kind of off the cuff and it is, it is quite hilarious, but uh, he, there is a deeper truth in what his friend said. Um, you know, because I think sound, scientific knowledge and political knowledge both consist of questioning the establishment, questioning the kind of knowledge that authority hands down to you, to always be skeptical. And I think Haldane, as much as he was skeptical in his science, uh, and it helped him because he was able to test and come up with theories for himself, didn't take knowledge for granted. Similarly, in, in politics also, he was always questioning of the kind of political legitimacy that uh, some knowledge had. Uh, the other important point to make here is that the study of evolution and then the study of genetics, this was always very closely bound up with politics. Uh, we know, for example, that Darwin and Wallace uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, who also came up independently with his theory of natural selection. They both read uh, Thomas Malthus, uh, whose essay on the principle of population is such a foundation of economics. You know, Malthus's political idea or political economic idea was that humans are competing for resources. There are finite resources uh, that uh, grow um, sort of uh, non-geometrically, that go arithmetically. And uh, human, if human wants and desires grow geometrically, then there will be an imbalance between humans and resources. And uh, that is bound to tell upon the, the systems of politics that we come up with. Uh, and, and so this idea of humans competing for resources had a great deal of influence on how the theory of natural selection was framed by uh, Darwin and Wallace. And then early in the 20th century, the first forays into genetics took place among all sorts of broader events. You know, the slow decline of empire, the British empire in particular, and the worry that this was because of a degradation in the quality of the British male. This is something that you see quite often as an obsession in the writing of the time, whether physiologically the biology of the British male uh, is being sapped, the strength is being degraded, that kind of thing. In America, there were different concerns. The concerns were about immigrants, and colored people and how they might quote unquote crossbreed with the white race. Uh, this obsession overall with racial puri purity reached its climax in, as we know, Nazi Germany. Uh, and, and a lot of these things have only been sort of revived over the last uh, couple of decades as, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm talking about the knowledge of these uh, obsessions, the racial obsessions of their time in Britain and America, that has only sort of started to come to light once again recently. So we have always thought of the first half of the 20th century, you know, the maximum amount of obsession with racism and racial purity was in Nazi Germany. But there were a lot of things that were happening in Britain and America that we should know about. So in Britain, for example, thousands of people were segregated because of concerns that their quote unquote feebleness of mind or body would pass to new generations. In America, thousands were sterilized. This includes not just colored people, but also some white people who were thought to be unfit. Um, so even before the principles of genetics began to make themselves fully apparent, people and societies were leaping ahead of themselves. They were arriving at all sorts of false conclusions about genes and race. Um, needless to say, of course, as we know, these conclusions have not disappeared at all. Uh, there is a historian called Gary Worski, who put it very well, I think. Uh, his quote is, uh, and I quote from his book now, how in a society based on hierarchies of class, race, and sex, could a science of human differences either be kept out of the political area or more radically be anything other than a political subject? So his point is that the minute you talk about genetics as the, uh, a science that shows you why one organism is different from another organism, um, that science is automatically liable to be manipulated by uh, or feed into uh, political notions of what difference means. 
Haldane became a fellow traveler, as they call it, of the Communist Party in the 1930s. But it was quite a while before he joined formally. Um, this was in May 1942, finally, that he became a member of the party. Uh, and around this time, a lot of other scientists and intellectuals in Europe and the US uh, uh, also became a member of the Communist Party. Uh, the attraction of the Soviet Union, I think, in the 1920s and 30s uh, was evident to Haldane, I think. Uh, because to set up a society around socialist lines seemed to hold in like a big social experiment, you know, a promise to run a society along scientific lines, scientific socialism, as they called it. Uh, but also for Haldane, the USSR appeared to uh, Haldane to prize its scientists much more than his own country. He was constantly complaining about how uh, science in the UK was underfunded, that politicians did not listen to the advice of scientists. In the USSR, at least as far as he could see in the 1920s, that was not the case. He really thought that uh, scientists were getting a lot more funding, that their advice and their discoveries were informing policy much more than in the UK. Um, uh, one other scientist who was uh, a communist similarly, J.D. Bernal, he liked to cite statistics of how much greater a percentage of the national budget the Soviet Union was spending on scientific research compared to the UK. Um, and as Europe slipped even further towards fascism and war, uh, Haldane held on to the USSR much more tightly because he thought it was a bulwark against fascism and, and war. Uh, the Communist Party was uh, had an anti-war stance and definitely had an anti-fascist stance. And as Hitler and Mussolini, their armies sort of uh, grew and their uh, aggression on the continent grew, Haldane definitely thought that the only country capable of saving Europe from total fascism was the Soviet Union with its, uh, with its, with its, with its own huge uh, resources. Uh, in 1948, and this is the so-called Lysenko affair that I want to talk about, uh, Haldane's marriage of science and politics reaches what you might call an inflection point. Uh, that year, he had to decide whether he, he wanted to back the Communist Party's support of a scientist called Trofim Lysenko, uh, who you see in the visual here. He is a man on the right. Uh, Lysenko was a biologist who had claimed to discover some agricultural techniques that went against many established principles of genetics. You know, one of his Lysenko's uh, beliefs was that what you might call acquired characteristics. Uh, these are characteristics that you acquire during your own lifetime. Uh, Lysenko believed you could you could you could pass them on to your children. So, for example, uh, if I uh, go as a as a man from Madras, if I move to uh, the Arctic Circle somewhere in northern Sweden uh, in my youth, and over the course of decades, I get more and more used to the cold over there. Uh, and then I have a child at some point in my 30s or 40s. Uh, you know, Lysenko's principle in this case would be that the child would also be similarly uh, accustomed to the cold uh, in the space of this just one generation, right? So uh, this is what we mean when we say acquired ca characteristics can be inherited. This is what uh, Lysenko believed. Lysenko also thought chromosomes weren't real. Uh, he claimed he could turn wheat into rye R-Y-E, the grain, with his techniques, which as a historian remarked, is like saying that dogs can give birth to foxes if they are bred in the woods. Lysenko also argued against a statistical and a mathematical approach to genetics, which is ironic in this case, because it, that was really Haldane's whole career. So despite this, for a variety of reasons that we don't need to go into now necessarily, Haldane chose to back the Communist Party. This was at least what the public saw. Uh, I describe in my book that the truth of Haldane's position was much more complicated. He argued internally with the party all the time about its line on Lysenko and his science. Nevertheless, publicly at this crucial moment in 1948, he chose to defend Lysenko, at least by claiming to keep an open mind about Lysenko's science. Uh, more unforgivable, I think, is the fact that he hedged when he was questioned about how Lysenko had started off all these purges of geneticists and biologists who opposed him. A lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people lost their lives. This was all in Lysenko's own uh, influence in the government. 
so anybody who opposed Lysenko was treated as an enemy of the state. Something we see more and more in rhetoric um, around the uh, around the world today. To criticize the state or to criticize Lysenko meant that you were anti-national, that you deserve to go away to a gulag or to be shot or at least to have your job suspended. So the temptation uh, from this holiday Lysenko episode might be to uh, you know, to argue that scientists should not take political stances. So my argument actually is the opposite. My argument is that the Lysenko episode is an aberration. It's the sole example in Haldane's career where he allowed his political loyalty to get the better of his scientific integrity. Uh, the rest of his life was spent in exalting the scientific method and its quest for evidence and in trying to communicate this perspective, instill this perspective in his readers as well as his students. So if you read his essays and his columns, everything is devoted to looking at the world with skeptical rationality. Uh, and this engagement that he had with the public sphere was quite crucial at a time when he was trying to dispel all these false notions about racial purity, atomic power, disease, genetic manipulation, all these subjects that were being used as propaganda by states and politicians and ideologues. Uh, his most valuable quality, I think, was this persistent belief that science had to be considered in its social context. So if you look at the titles of his books, Science and Ethics, Science and Everyday Life, Science in Peace and War, uh, and you look at his most famous essay, there's an essay called Daedalus, in which he considers the prospects of advanced genetics and says that human species will need to come up with a new sense of morality and ethics if we have to deal with technological progress. So there's really an essential humanism at the heart of the scientific outlook, and there's an essential uh, scientific temper at the heart of his consideration of human society. So if you read his essays now, and I encourage you to seek them out online, many of them are available for free. Um, he has these scientifically argued political beliefs for the equitable societies against colonialism, against rampant capitalism, against religion, for internationalism, you know, all of these speak, these topics speak very resonantly to us today. Uh, the time when Haldane lived, I think, was a time when there was no artificial firewall between science and politics. Uh, Haldane at that time was not by any means the only scientist to hold and advocate for political views. Um, in my view, this is quite different from the last third of the 20th century or so when scientists became increasingly reluctant to advocate for political positions and to give their opinions on science in the context of the state. Uh, I think there are a few reasons for this. One I mentioned earlier, scientists have much less grounding in the humanities these days. Uh, what you have to do when you enter university, if you want to be an academic a researcher, you have to start specializing very, very early. Uh, in the very first year of university, you need to uh, figure out uh, if you want to have a fulfilling career where eventually you want to land up, you have to start taking internships in the sciences very early. Uh, so you start specializing so early that you don't get the kind of grounding that scientists did earlier in the humanities and the social sciences. My second argument is I think um, scientists today are very dependent on grants from either big nonprofits or governments or corporations. And as a result, it's difficult to voice critical opinions about them. Uh, and third, I think there has been a confusion among a lot of scientists in the last third of the 20th century that being apolitical is the same thing as being scientifically objective. I think these two have been confused. Um, I think maybe uh, only with climate change, I think have you seen scientists really strongly take positions on policy issues? Uh, otherwise, for a long time, uh, scientists just didn't do that. I have to say this is slowly changing quite coincidentally over the last four or five years, just as I was researching this book. Um, I started work on this in 2016. Uh, and in 2016 also, as we know, Donald Trump was elected. Uh, the very next year, you started to see these marches for science around the world. I think scientists have started to realize that uh, there are a lot of deliberate assaults on fact and truth. Uh, on the point of view of politicians, but also on the point of view of other, from the point uh, from uh, other parties. And we are realizing the failure of, you know, calm scientific evidence to influence government policy. Uh, so one of the most heartening things that has happened 
um, in fact, uh, over the last few years has been this increasing rise of consciousness that scientists need to resume their role as broader public intellectuals. Uh, to paraphrase the French statesman, George Clemenceau, I, we all, I think in particular politics is too important to be left to the politicians. Uh, at the moment, Haldane right now provides a really indispensable model to look to, both to borrow his courage and his outspokenness, but also to take one, a lot of warning from the one misstep that he made, which is the Lysenko uh, affair. Uh, I promised to talk a little bit about um, what archives are used and what archival research involves for a project like this. Uh, this is a list of the archives that I consulted, most of them in Great Britain, a uh, couple in a few in other countries. Um, you can see there that ISI in Calcutta has uh, still has an Haldane archive. Uh, there's a, uh, an archive in Hyderabad, the CCMB, because after he died in India in 1964, his wife uh, was shift, uh, took a role in Hyderabad at CCMB and uh, she took uh, a lot of things over there where they are still present. Uh, most of his papers are in University College London uh, because that was his original institution or rather the institution where he spent uh, most amount of time. Um, and I think in a, in a way that I think was for the best. Uh, the reason is his, after he died, his sister came down to India uh, and uh, just as she came, she noticed that uh, some of his staff and his um, servants were burning huge numbers of papers in the garden of his house. And she told them, she asked them what it was. They said, um, these are all papers that were collected from some of Haldane's collections. So she told them immediately to put out the fire. And apparently his wife was uh, quite all right with this, which befuddles me, I don't know why. But uh, she put a stop to that and she made sure that all the papers, his letters, notes, drafts, everything that was humanly possible. She took a lot of them back to England uh, with her. Um, unfortunately, a lot of his research on his own, Haldane's research on his own father, his own father's letters, some of his diaries, all of that, because Haldane planned to write a book on his father and never got around to doing it. Unfortunately, a lot of that was lost in that big bonfire, which is a great shame. And it is a um, I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's a relief to biographers like me that the papers were taken back to England and stored in a way that they can still be accessible 60 years later. I just want to give you uh, three samples of his writing. Uh, this is what a lot of his archival, a lot of my work in the archives involved, right, which is pouring over letters and documents like this. Uh, on the left, you can see a letter to his mother, who he, whom he called Maya, uh, while he was at Eton, a uh, very schoolboyish kind of letter. Um, but even then kind of talking about big things, uh, you know, about whether he was an atheist, for example, and he says he's an agnostic, uh, clearly grappling with big issues already. The second is a letter that he wrote home from the war. Uh, he would write in pencil and sh on short pieces of paper and send that back home. And in the third, this is from the latter stage of his life when he's already at Calcutta. Uh, and uh, he, uh, it might be interesting to read this off, read the first line, since this is a science forum. Dear sir, I think homeopathy is an excellent theory insofar as it kills off fools who believe in it. So that is, uh, we know Haldane's views on homeopathy now. Um, so, uh, you know, at, I wanted to speak about the experience of spending years, literally in my case, kind of going through a person's records like this, you know. Um, Holden always seemed to be scratching away at something all the time. You know, on the tube, when he on the train, he would pull out a notebook of his, out of his bag, balance it on his knees and work on his equations. Um, you know, in pubs, he would leave idle sums on cocktail napkins. In meetings that bored him, he would doodle in Greek. Uh, during the Second World War, when fresh paper was a luxury, he sometimes used one side of a sheet for his statistical calculations. Then he flipped it over and he would write a letter to somebody on it. So uh, there's something very meaningful and intimate about reading the papers in person, uh, as for example, at the National Library of Scotland. Um, I want to uh, uh, write, I want to read out for you um, a small excerpt from a piece I wrote about the experience of uh, of spending all my time with these papers. Uh, 
at the national library of scotland for example in edinburgh where i went in the brom in the warm bright reading room up on the second floor the ritual repeated itself pulling a catalog off the shelves filling in request slips waiting half an hour or an hour for the boxes of red heart cardboard to be hoisted out of the bowels of the archive propping a letter or a notebook open on a soft foam stand uh, the paper kept down by a string of heavy beads remembering the admonishment only pencils the work felt ceremonial it was as if some specter of holden were judging my worth every time before releasing one further aspect of himself into my hands the archives contain among the first things he ever wrote letters to his father a scientist who often traveled to other towns to study their coal mines or sewer systems Dear Afar, for Halden wrote when he was four or five, using his ba- boyish mangling of father. Are there any interesting things? If there are, please tell me about them. Most of these words were misspelled. The archives contain the bumptious speeches he made for the debating club at Eton, the apocalyptic poems. Uh, yeah, I think I think we have lost him. Uh, yeah, okay. Hi, someone. Hello. I think we have lost uh, connection to uh, Saman. I just wait for him to join us once again. Gopu, are you there? Hi, yes, I'm here. Uh, want to announce anything about the next week's, uh, next month's lecture rather? Have we uh, finalized it so we can... I think Arvi can probably, or Ramon can say, is if they have talked to, we talked to Vinay Nair. Vinay Nair will be the... Uh, Arvi, can you, can you give an update of uh, what lecture we are going to have for... Uh, uh, Okay, when I, okay, the topic, uh, let me recall, uh, Gopu, have, we haven't uh, finalized the topic, right? No, but yeah, he's talking about different approaches to um, mathematics, I think, because it's, uh, okay. it's a little bit of Brahma Uttar involved. You want to uh, 
say something more about the speaker himself, if not the topic? Yeah, Arvi, go ahead. Fine, Patrick. Just give a very simple outline of, uh, you know, I've just messaged uh, someone today. It's not seen. Uh, you know, his phone seems to be somewhere else and he seemed to have completely lost it. Maybe some uh, internet connectivity bust. One yeah. second, I'll just quickly refresh my conversation with Vinay in terms of the topic. Uh, In the meantime, we can uh, hope we can talk about uh, the workshops that we have so far offered and uh, plans for further workshops on, uh, you know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you, you why don't you just give a brief account of uh, the workshop that you have been offering. And then I will also talk about uh, the two workshops that I have done and what I have in plan for that in terms of new workshops that I would like to offer. Okay. So I gave an, uh, I've, I've done four batches of a particular workshop on Indian astronomy and mathematics. It's kind of a, a history of Indian astronomy and mathematics as much as, you know, the way it developed from the very earliest page, earlier, very earliest days. Uh, there are references to astronomical observations and uh, some numbers and things like that in the Vedas, which don't really constitute mathematics or astronomy, but give a sense of what they were. And from then on, we had a formal book called the Vedanga Jyotisha. And then uh, there are a bunch of other developments later, uh, about uh, 18 books called the Siddhantas from about 500 BC to 500 AD. Followed by, this, this was followed by uh, rigorous mathematical astronomy, starting with Aryabhata, Varaha Mihra, and others, and later on continued by Brahmagupta, Bhaskaracharya, and uh, you know, a bunch of others, including you know, mathematicians in Kerala, Sripati, and uh, others. So I cover the entire history of the development of Indian mathematics and astronomy in my course. It's about not very complicated. Uh, some of the math is about eight standard level. And we have I've done it one for one batch of school students and for four batches of adults, including one last batch that we did entirely online. So if uh, enough interest uh, develops, we'll do another batch also perhaps online. So but you want to talk about your... Uh... Yes. So I have uh, so far uh, handled the two uh, topics. The first one was... Uh, uh, yeah, one second. Uh, just give me a minute. Uh, Samant is asking. So I've just uh, messaged him, oh, he's here. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Samantha, I think we uh, lost you in the connection. I don't know what yeah, happened. Yeah, I don't actually. I don't know what happened also. I was kind of... Uh, Okay. Well, um, I'm back, guys. Sorry for the technical glitch. I don't know how, why it disconnected me. Um, are we... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, we are, uh, we are in the last page, so... Uh... Yeah, just can you just go back to one, one page before and I can just finish up the point I was making and then we can, uh, we will, yes. Oh, it's a, uh, sorry, you know, it's a very last... Went to the... Yeah, I'll just move it. Yeah. That's here, right? Yeah, yeah this is really well. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yes. 
um uh the, i mean the point i was trying to make uh, is that you know through his handwriting the, these documents that i was looking at through his handwriting alone uh, i could sort of watch holden grow before my eyes you know from childhood as a, as you see on the left to adolescence uh and then into adulthood and even up to death uh in fact the uh the very last essay that he wrote is still preserved in long hand in one of the notebooks so you can see uh the cradle to grave transformation of of somebody and uh, the only people i think to witness such complete arcs of life at close quarters are uh, i mean apart from biographers maybe the unfortunate parents who happen to outlive their adult children um and so when i read holden's final essay uh, i still in my mind i could still vividly remember the letter he wrote at the excitable age of 5 to his grandmother telling him telling her about an ice cream that he had eaten uh, no one who had written a biography ever had told me what a heartbreaking exercise it is to go through these arcs as you witness their um, the people's transformation through their lives uh so it was quite a moving i mean apart from all the science and the rationality uh evident in holden's work it is also quite a moving experience at least or it was for me at least uh to be able to write this and i think that uh, concludes uh, the talk thank you so much for having me and uh, apologies for a couple of technical outages uh, thank you thank you samantha it's uh, i have uh, lots of questions i have uh, Hopefully, there will be some questions from the audience as well. Uh, the, uh, you know, let's keep talking, and while uh, there are uh, appropriate questions, I will uh, also throw them at you. Maybe about about ten minutes, ten to fifteen minutes, we can have if that's okay for you. Uh, so you okay. can have. Okay, sounds questions. good. So, uh, first thing is that I know I have been reading all your books uh, uh, right through, uh, and uh, this one, I when when you mentioned it uh, well before uh, uh, you know the. Uh, the actual book came out you had mentioned that you were uh, going to write this book and uh, it was accepted by uh, your publisher uh, i was quite surprised because i didn't see you as a science related writer so i mean again haldin is not just a scientist it's more than that but uh, uh, you know were you really uh, you know always you know, and any of our interactions uh, at any point in time we had never really talked about science at uh, right at all so how was it into uh, you know uh, were you already familiar with all the scientific concepts or you were learning them as you go uh, i went along trying to uh, research on him how did it uh, work uh, i i was i was i i have to say i was not i mean i i read sort of popular books about um genetics uh, one for example would be you know siddharth mukherjee's the gene mm. that people here may be familiar about right. so i i read a lot of popular science books but i was not familiar with the ins and outs of uh the theory of natural selection or uh, or, or genetics in the first half of the 20th century and certainly holden's own work is uh, quite mathematical and it was with a great deal of uh difficulty in understanding i mean and and conversations with other scientists that i was able to school myself in um, in in this in these topics even now actually i mean i think Uh, i would not be able to tell you at an individual level how the equations are working and so on but the broad outlines of the papers and the results that he arrived and how he arrived at them that too i was able to make out because of uh, a sort of a period of intense study that i put myself through uh, but the interest was always there i think i mean and the interest is there i think particularly because uh, genetics and, uh, and and the biology of human differences is such a is such a charged subject right it is not just restricted to that sphere alone people talk about it sometimes with a lot of misunderstanding um and it is used and manipulated in many ways and i think that was the main attraction for me so if he had been a pure scientist uh maybe i would not have written about him in the same way but the fact that his life embodied these mixtures of science and politics and uh, i think that was the big draw for me uh you know uh, we uh, know you i mean at least those of us who have been uh, closely watching you on uh, your writing uh, in the recent times in particular you know you have been uh, uh, doing very well with your long form uh, writing and uh, uh, you know and i, I uh, started following you as a cricket writer so, right 
so how how do you take on these different roles i mean as a cricket writer including the recent uh, uh one on anderson so we will uh, yeah. maybe you know we'll probably not talk about it as much given the forum is more uh, science oriented but no, there is a know, science there is a science of uh, swing bowling that we can definitely talk about yeah certainly so from the science right we get the, about 10 times the audience that your holiday in cricket so true so uh, from cricket writing to uh, you know general interest long form writing uh to a biography i mean of, of course your your earlier books if you look at it mean about uh, you know uh, fish uh, and fishing and uh, you know related uh, thing around the coast which i really right. enjoy to sri lanka uh, the book on sri lanka which is uh, which is a you know totally different it's a heavier subject really right uh the, you know uh, to uh, to a biography I mean, they have right. some change substantially so uh, you know it's difficult to actually place you as you know what kind of a writer uh, are you really yeah so how, yeah. how has it been for you as a, a writer moving from one to the other i mean in some ways i feel like uh, this is the kind of career i was always aiming for uh, you know when i started out as a journalist um, i could not kind of imagine being a journalist who wrote about the same thing day in and day out for the best part of 20 years there are people who do that and they do it very well and in fact it is a huge testament to their levels of attention and um, persistence that they can do that my interest was always kind of to uh, actually explore diff- as many different subjects as possible but each one in a considerable level of depth and the only way i eventually found that i could do that was to as i am doing now do a lot of uh, well a small number of very big pieces uh in which each piece takes about 3 or 4 or 5 months to research and write uh in which you talk to dozens of people and you read books and you read papers and you educate yourself um and then you write the piece and of course with books it's even more of you know it's a multi year process it's 4 or 5 years for a book where you again you're going through this period of self education uh so the entire sort of appeal for me from this kind of career lies exactly in the diversity of subjects now that is it has its pluses and minuses as you may imagine um, you are never an expert in anything if anyone is ever i going to think about um you know some expert to call about cricket and ask them for their views it will not be me uh, similarly if it's going to be about uh, the vaccine science even though i've written four pieces on covid vaccine science this year it will not be me it will be somebody who has been doing this for 10 years so and that is uh, you know it's a, it's a it's just something you have to live with but the flip side is my daily life becomes a lot more interesting so i think about genetics for the better part of 3 or 4 years simultaneously i am talking to the best fast bowler in the history of cricket as far as statistics go uh, and then two weeks later i'm thinking about the aviation industry and what that has what has happened to the aviation industry during the course of this pandemic then i will think about uh, artificial intelligence and what uh, computer scientists call qa modeling where you try to get um ai systems to understand questions and respond uh, as humans do so i mean and this is just a short set of things that i've been i will be working on over the next few weeks and for me the enjoyment comes only from this uh, the fact that i can talk to this huge range of people and pick their ideas and pick their brains for ideas and so on so uh, coming back to halden uh, like you you know when i first i, I uh, read about him in uh, Ramachandra Guha's book, first time. Yes. I mean, I had not really uh, uh, heard about him that much. So shows about uh, how little I had read about uh, great scientists around. In in fact, and, Ram was somebody who had persuaded me to do this book. I had mentioned it to him, and he had said, "You must." He had said, "You must do it. You must do it." Ram himself is writing a book, uh, which will be coming out soon, which is a compilation of profiles of uh, Westerners who made their home in India. Okay. Uh, and at that time he was thinking about holiday as a small chapter of these books yeah i think we have a connection problem on screen us think just as it was getting interesting we have lost him once again okay uh 
Uh, Coco, I think we, we should probably uh, uh, wrap it up because it's uh, 5.30 I now. Hope he's coming back. Uh, if he comes back, we will, but otherwise, let's just... Uh, uh, yeah. There are a few questions still on. I don't know if we can... We don't want to answer so it. There are the questions uh, which yeah. uh, you know people have asked and... Uh, we can ask him to answer there on the YouTube channel, perhaps. Right? Yeah, maybe. You know, uh, I don't know whether he's going to answer the political question that <laughs> Adhyaman has uh, asked. Uh, but anyway, I mean, I think uh, I think it's just late because there are other uh, events that we have to uh, focus on. Um, so we'll uh, we'll uh, you know close it out uh, with this. Uh, thank you, thank you, everyone. Uh, sorry about all the uh, uh, technical. Uh, problems that we have had this is uh, this is quite strange uh, it has not happened uh, like this before uh, so uh, thank you once again for uh, being there uh, for this uh, fairly interesting talk uh, and uh, particularly you know we, we uh, uh, request you to uh, pick up the book and uh, read the book uh, it's a it's an excellent book and uh, Samanth is a fantastic writer uh, I've been a reader of uh, it's writing right from the very early days of Cricking Co. when uh, I was there and he was there. Uh, as a, yeah, he's, he has just come here. Sorry, Badri. I've moved to a um, room with a better Wi Fi. Let's yeah, yeah, I think you know, there's a frequent interruption. Okay, yeah, yeah. so uh, you know you were you were you were talking about um, uh, Ramchandra Guha and uh, right. you know mentioning uh, how they uh, that's where uh, we lost you the last right yeah I mean so he had planned to put a profile of Holday in one of his in this new book that he's uh, bringing out but he definitely thought the life could explore a would would deserve a, a much longer treatment as well and I think before this book there had only been a couple of biographies of him that were not very uh, not very good, frankly. I mean, they were not either not a good consideration of his politics or a good consideration of his science and definitely not of how these two interacted. So I think because of that, uh, Ram also felt that it was quite warranted, which is why I took this on. Now, uh, uh, one question on uh, Haldane coming to India and then continuing to do his research here. Did it have any impact on Indian science itself in terms of uh, the topics of research or the quality of research or... Uh, what can we say as his contribution, not to his own research, but to those around him? I think uh, the problem was that he was here for a very short time. He was here for about six and a half years before he died in two different institutions. Uh, so his impact was, I think, considerable upon the students who he took on, uh, but not considerable at an institutional level or at a you know, at a scientific level across the... So for example, in Calcutta, a number of the science, uh, students that he uh, groomed, so to speak, went on to occupy, uh, to do interesting research and become important uh, scientists, either in India or abroad. Uh, he was very much, um, I think he, he was a huge advocate of bringing people into his own fold of students who were not from the original, sort of the ordinary scientific ranks. So, you know, he would receive letters all the time from people from various corners of the country saying, I want to work with you. And I'm, I've been working on, for example, there was one young man from Tamil Nadu called T.A. Wilson, who wrote to him saying that I've been working on the genetics of the coconut tree and of coconuts. And Holden believed very much that Indian scientists and Indian biologists in particular should work with this huge diversity of flora and fauna that we have in our country. And so, uh, so his impact in that sense was restricted to just the people he interacted with, I think. By that time, he had become uh, an, an older and more tired man. I think he was not waging big political battles uh, with the bureaucracy trying to enlarge budgets and things like that. Uh, and uh, and then he moved to Bhubaneswar and he spent the last two and a half years there building up a small institute that unfortunately closed as soon as he died. Uh, so so in, in that sense, the best of his scientific work uh, uh, was behind him by the time he came here. Um, this is on the politics. Uh, K. R. Adhyaman uh, asks a question about, uh, you know, particularly he wants to talk about Vavilo, who he says was a personal friend of uh, uh, Haldane, and yet he was executed uh, for uh, refuting Leshenkovism 
but haldane fell to defend vavilov and glasgow as institution yes that is absolutely right i mean um, he uh, that uh, is it is one thing to side with lysenko or uh, uh, you know uh, defend the soviet government because you have other considerations but uh, when it comes to you know your own personal friend and uh, he is executed for his views yeah so holden's logic in all of this was i mean he had i, th- I think you can isolate uh, his own how he has rationalized it to himself which is that he felt at that time the best way to serve both his own uh, integrity but also his uh, loyalty to the party was to issue these defense these guarded defenses of lysenko and the party in public but to raise big debates within the party in private so one of the things that i have found uh, in the course of this research is his huge obsession with finding out what happened to vavilov and this is something i discuss in the book as well in fact you will see little scribble you know in one letter i found uh, he has scribbled to himself as a memo almost on the side find out what happened to vavilov um because he was quite uh, I, he was quite distressed or as he should have been by the disappearance of this guy the truth of vavilov's death by the way did not come out until quite a few years after he died so the uncertainty persisted uh, until well into the mid 1940s i would say um everybody knew he was dead but the gulag that he died in how he died why he died how long he was spent there all of that the details came out later um but your question i missed his name but he was certainly right by yeah, saying that yeah, yeah mr quite uh, disgraceful it i think in that entire defense of lysenko the most disgraceful part of it was his inability to defend um his inability to criticize the death of vavilov and even the rustication of other academics who were forced out of the soviet academia uh, whether to gulags or just out of the colleges uh, on the whims of lysenko uh, so he's quite right when he says that uh, back to one key point that you were talking about of synthesizing the uh, you know uh, mendelian view with uh, darwinian view uh, i'm i'm sure um, uh, haldane would have given a lot of lectures and uh, uh, you know explanations of that uh, mm-hmm. can you can you sort of talk about any of that which basically significantly shifted i mean not just the research papers because these were all uh, talked about uh, at the public level also right at the popular level so is there anything where uh, he sort of uh, you know explained uh, one of the things that you talk about is that uh, haldane as a science communicator mm so how did he bring about uh, you know explaining to people that both the mendelian view and the darwinian view uh, you know come together and they make sense uh, okay so i should say that the mendelian darwinian debate uh, was obviously it was an academic debate debate within the biology uh, within the community of biologists so as a result holden himself never explained the modern synthesis for uh, what you might call the lay person uh he wrote one book called the causes of evolution in which he which i guess sort of a lay person could read but it is quite complicated even uh, so and definitely in in none of his essays and columns did he ever do this but um uh, but we talked about him as a science communicator and I, I, it's great because holden himself has written an essay on how to write about science uh and i think uh, you know orwell for example has this uh, a uh, classic essay called the politics of the english language where he talks about how the language itself is bent and distorted when politicians use it or when political writers use it i think this essay holden on how to talk about how to write about science should be just as famous it has a number of extremely useful sensible uh, nuggets of advice uh, that we can all take away not just to read about write about science but write about anything so one of his uh, i mean uh, one of his things that i always remember is always pick something that your audience already knows about you know uh, an example that they are already familiar with enlarge it a little bit enlarge it a little bit further still until you come to the scientific point that you are making uh, so for example he starts off one uh, essay on actually very relevant in this day and age about infectious diseases he starts off one essay about how he and his wife both have the flu he starts off another essay about hormones uh with an item that was then in the news in the tabloids about how a particular english football team was supposed to be grinding up monkey glands and putting it into their uh you know uh, supplements dietary supplements so that they could play better 
and from there from that little piece of salacious tabloid news he went to goes on to talk about hormones in a broader sense uh he he is really so he i think he made this um uh, for example if you want to talk about steam and steam power and so on you don't start off with the engine right away because not everybody's seen an engine but you start off with talking about a kettle on the gas and you see the steam escaping and so on so really very very practical advice that i would um, i would i in fact that essay should be also be read by by everyone because it has a number of other tips that maybe i'm not able to recall off the top of my mind the language should be clear and always direct uh, don't use jargon as much as possible uh, that kind of thing uh, this is a question from srinivasan narayanan this dd kosambi made his mapping by using haldane function since they are contemporaries uh, any correspondence between them were you able to no there were no there was none unfortunately uh, this is i say it's unfortunate because actually i was uh, i am friends with a, an academic at jnu or he was a jnu who was writing his own or researching his own uh, books on kosambi at the time so we would talk a lot about holden this holden kosambi mapping function is quite famous mm-hmm. but that is literally the only way in which these two uh, figures come together kosambi interestingly continued to defend lysenko even after lysenko himself had fallen out of favor <laughs> in the soviet union um so this was also something that puzzled my friend greatly as to why uh, kosambi would go to such lengths to uh, remain a committed lysenkoist even after he had been discredited okay ah uh. No, I think we have uh, really run out. I have one. If, uh, yeah, you, yes, yes, go for it. Amant, uh, I think the point about essays is very important. So he was one of the best essays I've read in the 20th century, uh, Haldane. Uh, yes. Both of science and of you know, you talked about his political uh, points and uh, writing to the public, but his essays, even on biology, are extraordinary, uh, well written. Probably Stephen Jay Gould later on was the only one who came that close to getting you know public. Uh, essays you know reading reaching the public at that level that wide a popularity also and my question was this you mentioned about how he was a, he was a mathematician who became a biologist there aren't too many of those um, right. and and is uh, you know kind of aversion to kind of the formal academic structure which if i remember right uh, freeman dyson who passed away recently had a similar thing he said the reason he moved to princeton from cornell was because cornell forced him to do a phd and he didn't want to do a phd and jvs haldane did world class cutting edge research without you know doing this formal academic stuff can you say something about that well i mean it's true that he was very proud of it all his life you know he would say i don't have a degree in the sciences he had a degree in maths so i mean he was bending the truth a little bit to say he had never studied anything from the scientific world maths i think is especially in the way that he used it is quite a is a scientific enough discipline but i think look to the credit of the academic world and maybe to uh, put a caveat into what freeman dyson said and holden held all his life it is I, i think it is a natural corollary of the progression of science that as it becomes more specialized and more um, fine grained uh, it is difficult to do ground breaking research uh, without a degree in the sciences right i mean you need to know the uh, the lay of the field before you can figure out what has not been tilled yet so to speak uh holden came onto the scene at a very particular point in history in the history of genetics when there was so much uh you know until land that he could uh, kind of go over without necessarily the benefit of a degree without the necessary, necessary implement so to speak uh those kind of times do not come around often they come around increasingly less and less as the science progresses as uh, ideas and evidence develop and there a foundation of knowledge is established holden's own work was very foundational and to lay the foundation it is perhaps true although not always i would think but perhaps true that you don't need to have a degree to do it but i think once you build upon those foundations and you uh, get more and more specialized it's difficult to do the kind of exciting new research uh, of the kind that holden did now having said that uh, i still hold to my original argument that there is definitely a case to be made for scientists to not specialize that much quite so early in their career to be to allow them to sort of explore fields that include humanities but also maybe uh, other sciences other than the ones that they are themselves going to work in because the cross fertilization that you talked about mathematics and genetics that he worked in that is the kind of thing that even scientists who are working today tell me very often does not happen as much as it should, as it should the kind of institutes that allow that um, the institute for advanced study at princeton for example where freeman dyson was based 
those are few and far between uh, although i should say holden supposedly got a, an offer late in life to join the institute for advanced studies at princeton he turned it down calling it the institute for advanced salaries and went to india instead now this is a story that i've heard only once and i was not able to verify it but um, it's delicious enough that i can t- talk about it on a zoom call i think um gopu can we so okay uh, thank you very much uh, that was a wonderful presentation we uh, enjoyed uh, hopefully a lot of a lot of us will read the book i actually came to your book review a few months back before the right uh, yeah. and uh, so it was a wonderful presentation thank you we have kind of uh, you know trying to get uh, uh, non metra speakers to speak at this forum during you know that this we thought this is the best time to use uh, zoom and the internet to get it and so we are very happy that you obliged uh, well actually right. we we wanted someone to be uh, present in person and give the talk absolutely i am completely a metra speaker please don't uh, yeah. no no <laughs> but now now the fact that you are not in chennai as of now we will treat you as right. a non metra speaker absolutely absolutely yes <laughs> yes go please so thank you very much okay. uh, we hope you'll uh, you know give a lecture in the future also we always like repeat speakers uh, there will be swing bowling sounds very appealing to me so if you talk if you are willing to talk about the science of swing bowling i am very curious about that uh, absolutely we should do another one soon yeah yes. so thank you all for joining us today in this evening we will announce the next program of the uh, the speaker is vinay nair we'll send out the invitations to uh, through email and facebook and whatsapp to those who are interested Uh, those of you who don't know you can see this talk on our youtube channel varamira science forum channel we have a facebook channel we have a whatsapp group you can contact us and we can add you to it so thank you all and have a nice evening thank you